Lord, we're going to open in a word of prayer, and uh, we just uh, want to remember to pray for Karen Piantic as she continues to recover from surgery, and has been experiencing some pain with that, and uh, effects from some of the pain medication on her stomach, so we just want to pray for Karen and Bob this morning, and we'll pray for uh, Marsha's dad, a, a friend of uh, Judy's, and he's not in good health, and a lot of things happening there. I want to pray for him this morning as well. Let's bow our hearts in prayer. Father, thank you for your faithfulness in our lives and, and uh, that we can be in a place uh, that we can gather together without fear or concern and worship you and uh, seek you, learn from your word, encourage one another. We just pray you'll be a part of everything that's happening in our lives today and, and, and in our service today. We yield all of the plans that we have to you for your, your choice and your pleasure. When we pray for Karen this morning, I just pray that even as we're gathered here this morning, that she's going to feel your presence and you'll bring just healing and relief uh, from the pain and the, the effects of the, of the medication, Lord, to just, just minister to her body this morning. And we pray for Marcia's dad this morning. Lord, you see all of the need in his life and, and uh, God, that you'll speak to his heart that if he's not ready to know you, if he doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, that that you'll put someone in his life that can share the love of Christ with him and that he can come to know Jesus as, as he begins to see that the eternity is not far from his life. And I'll minister to him, we pray. And we pray for Pastor Bame and uh, Real Life Church. I pray your blessing on their services today, their ministry that they bring to our community. Pray for Pastor Bame as he leads a congregation. I'll give him wisdom, Lord, empower him by your spirit as he ministers in our church and in our community. And we pray as well for our churches in Panama. We think of Bouquet Campus that this morning up in the, in the city of David in the far northern part of the country. Uh, Lord, I just pray your blessing on their ministry, their services today, and ministry in their community. We continue to pray for Sonia and Jose. Uh, Lord, that uh, you would just uh, bring health to their bodies and lives as well. And we pray for uh, Pastor Anya and Galena that in Ukraine as they lead the churches of praise and all that's happening there with relief efforts within their city and outside of the city and all of the things that are going on. You see all of the need that's there. We pray for your wisdom, for your provision, for your strength and guidance. We think of our missionaries today. Lord, we pray for the Pharisees and their ongoing work with Wycliffe Bible Translators and the work that they do here uh, on behalf of Wycliffe across the United States, Lord, that you'll just give wisdom and direction as they, as they work in that, uh, with that program and all the things that they're tasked with doing. And we think of the West Batals today and their, their ministry back and forth with Ukraine and Russia and what a difficult time this has to be in their, in their hearts as they've ministered in both countries and love both groups of people. We just pray for your peace and your guidance and your direction as they continue to communicate with friends in, in both of those countries and bring ministry 
uh, Lord, that you'll just guide and direct. We pray for church family members today. I want to pray for, for Brian and Shelley Mendenhall. Lord, I just pray your blessing on their home, on their marriage, the work that they do. Lord, that your, your, your presence and your life would just, just flow in their hearts and lives today. We pray for Lexi, Lord, for all of the kids. This is your light, hand would be on this entire family. We pray for Lee today. Lord, that you just surround Lee with your presence, with your strength, your grace, minister to her, that this would just be a, a week marked in her life with your presence and your grace. And Lord, now as we sing songs of praise and worship, we just pray that, uh, that as we honor you, as we worship you, that you will minister to our hearts as well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Bless the Lord. Joy to the nations when Jesus is here. 
my sons and daughters, embrace my call to love. Come away with me to the deepest deep. Come away with me, my love. Come away with me to the place of We thank you for your faithfulness in our lives and we do continue to pray for Ukraine and all that's, that's happening there with the, the invasion and just the humanitarian disaster that's taking place uh, beyond because of the war. And we just pray for your peace, for your provision, for your protection. And the Lord, we pray that as we, uh, <clears throat> as we look into your word today that, uh, that you'll speak to our hearts, direct us and guide us by your spirit. Help us, Lord, to, to be witnesses for you. Uh, the time is so short, and there's so many that, that still need to know Jesus. That, that's our daily task, is to share the grace that we've experienced with others around us so that they can, can know you as well. We thank you, Father, for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Bless the Lord. So, um... <laughs> Hopefully that video is going to work for us this morning. We've got that uh, video working. It, it, it seems like it worked this morning. So anyway, we've got this video from Ukraine. We can just pause that for a second. We want to 
And I remember, again, just to encourage you to continue to pray for Ukraine. And as I said last week, it's mostly a slideshow of, of a variety of pictures from several of the uh, pastors or churches that we've uh, sent some finances to to help them with their, uh, their efforts at bringing um, aid and care to people that are in more active war zones than perhaps where their church is at. And, uh, and that's uh, some incredible things that are happening. When that finishes, I'm going to read you just a short letter that Pastor Sergey uh, sent to me on Thursday afternoon, just kind of uh, expressing thanks to, to our church. And uh, so we'll share with that after we watch this uh, short video. stuff there. Sometimes you see the pictures and you don't know all of the stories behind those. And, and a lot of that was food that's been purchased and other things. Um, you saw a couple of pictures that had well, a bunch of little kids sitting at a table that were eating. And then you saw a picture, uh, a bunch of kids on a bus. Those are all orphan kids since the war began that were being fed at, at a church. And then the kids on the bus were being shipped to Lviv and then eventually to Poland. If you can imagine that busload of kids a month ago had parents and today they don't. Um, so I, I just this kind of the effects of what's going on there. And then at the end of that, uh, the last couple of pictures, uh, Pastor Sergei was there with um, some, some uh, Ukrainian soldiers, and this letter kind of talks a little bit about those last few pictures. You saw a washing machine and a dryer on the back of a truck, and there was a bunch of food in there. So let me read his letter to us. And he says, I want to thank you. Thank you very much. The Lord bless you. I received a revelation today that you and I are the hands of our Lord through which he helps those in need. Thank you. Today we were able to help Ukrainian soldiers. Let this next sentence sink, sink in for you. They did not have washing machines and they had not washed their clothes for 21 days. 
And we were able to deliver washing machine and dryer and hair clippers so that 500 soldiers who defend Ukraine could wash and dry their clothes. May the Lord bless you. The soldiers were also able to reach people who are in who are now in the gray zone. And we'll just put parentheses around that. The gray zone is the territory that is not controlled by either military, Russian or Ukrainian. Armed clashes regularly take place in this territory. Civilians are not allowed into the territory because if a stranger appears whom the soldiers don't know, they can shoot immediately to kill. And they have certain signals and warn in advance in case someone wanders into the gray zone. But there are many people, grandmothers and grandfathers, that have remained in the villages of the gray zone because it is their home. The Russian soldiers, when they came into these villages, took all of the food that they had. Thanks to you, because uh, today we were able to deliver flour and yeast and cereal and other items so that they could bake bread and we, could, we also were able to deliver uh, preservation and personal hygiene products through the military that was on that truck. Thank you very much. May the Lord bless you greatly. The Lord reigns. Pastor Sergey. And so it does make a difference. Um, there are other slides. If we've gone through those other slides, just some of the announcement slides, we'll let those go for a second. And so there's just there's a lot of things going on. You can see as of yesterday afternoon, $16,000 plus has come into the church, and we're passing that along. Um, so far, 14,000, almost 15,000 has been sent, and uh, we continue to, to work on getting those dollars there. So we appreciate everybody that gives, and there's a lot of people outside of our church that have figured out that they can give through our church, and so that's, those numbers grow because uh, on Friday, we got a 2,000 check from Nebraska because <laughs> somebody there knew that we were giving money directly to churches in Ukraine, and they said, we want to be a part of that, so we're going to send your, our money to you. And so we appreciate everybody that, that gives and participates in that. And, uh, and so Pastor Sergey and Vadim, they're, they're up in the Poltava region, and, uh, and they're um, about an hour and a half from Kharkiv. And most of those kids that you saw being fed and were on the bus were from the Kharkiv area. And uh, so they're doing a lot of ministry. They drive into that war zone, drop off food, pick up people, and bring them out. Um, there were a few pictures in one of those slides of people that were in a bomb shelter in in the Poltava area, and that's kind of where they're sleeping and staying until they decide that they either want to evacuate or until they can go back to the area that they are from. And so if you can imagine living in that basement place uh, for weeks on end on cots and all those things. So it's, it's vital that we just continue to pray for our friends in Ukraine and all the things that are going on in, in that, uh, that area. So we're going to let our kids, um, ages 3 through 6th grade, be dismissed to go to Children's Church now and Junior Church. They've got some great lessons prepared for them. I do want to remind you that next Sunday, the Minnesota Teen Challenge Group, the Adult and Teen Challenge Group from Rochester is going to be with us in our service. And uh, there will be a, a dinner right immediately following service next Sunday. And uh, we're, we've got ham ordered for meat. And then we're just asking everybody that's, that's going to be in church next Sunday, bring potluck dishes with you, bring enough to share. We're going to feed the group from, from Teen Challenge. And many times when they come, their family members that are within driving distance will come because they want to see their, their spouse or their kids or whoever their family is. They want to come and see them in that program and be able to visit with them. And so we, we anticipate a number of guests with us next Sunday beyond the Teen Challenge group. So... Um, we just encourage you to, to plan to stay for dinner next Sunday and get a chance to visit with some of those the folks that are in the uh, program and then bring extra food so that we can get everybody fed and, and uh, send them home tired from a uh, food hangover. And so, <laughs> and so we want to just be able to bless them in that direction. So, and there's other announcements. Men's Advance is coming up, guys. Well, you still got a couple of days so you can get registered. You can talk to Daryl after service this morning, and uh, that's next Friday and Saturday up at Lake Geneva Christian Center. And then there's other information in the bulletin as well, if you could be alert to those things. We're going to get back to the, uh, as you can see on the screen, our study through the book of Daniel this morning. This is going to be our sixth week studying this book of Daniel. And, and going back to the very first week, you probably already know what I'm going to say. As I began preparing for this series, the first thing I discovered, and I knew that I'm going to just keep communicating it over and over again, 
is this. The overarching theme of the book of Daniel is the sovereignty of God. He knows it all from beginning to end and everything in between, and he's all-powerful. He's, he, he's beyond the power of, of a lion's den. He's beyond the power of a fiery furnace. He's beyond the power of a king that thinks, I built all of this with my own strength, and he has the ability to humble our pride. And God is sovereign. And so uh, we, we see that time and again. And as we move into this seventh chapter now of Daniel, we're going to again see God displaying his sovereignty as he tells us in a dream. He gives Daniel this dream, tells him what he is. What, he really kind of gives the picture of where Daniel is at that moment. And then what is to come, not just in a couple of years from now, but it's still to come. It, in our, maybe in our lives time, some of this stuff is going to happen. And Daniel was able to see this in his dream. God knew it all those years ago, and we're still living some of those things out. So we'll start with a, just a couple of bullet points concerning this chapter, and then we'll, we'll jump into reading of the first part of the chapter. So the first thing we would say, true or false, nobody, no one knows the day or the hour of the second coming of Christ. And the answer to that is, of course, true. We don't know. We don't know when it's going to happen. Jesus talks about that. He said, the angels don't know, and the Son, I'm, I'm the Son, and I don't know. Only the Father knows. Now, he lays out some things that are signifier things. There's some things we can be alert to and be aware of, and we can know the timing as we see these uh, the dream and we see the kingdoms that are, are part of this dream. We can see how we're progressing along this larger timeline. Um, but to be real honest with you, you can spend hours and months and days and years studying the timeline and figuring out exactly where you are and not get anybody else to come to know Jesus. So I, I say, you know, read this, understand it a little bit, pursue this, but remember your number one task isn't to fig is not to figure out the timeline of the second coming of Jesus. Your number one task as a born-again believer is the ministry of reconciliation, helping other people come to know Christ. Because God's heart is that none would perish, that all would come to repentance. And if we spend all of our time on the details and the timelines, we're going to forget to tell people they need to know Jesus. And that's the significance of this. And so that's my own personal soapbox, and we'll move on from that. The second coming of, of Christ, friends, it will happen when the last of these four great kingdoms that we're going to read about is on, is on earth, ruling on earth. And Daniel 7 is really broken into two equal halves, the dream and the interpretation of the dream. The first half is the dream. The second half is the interpretation that Daniel received from his dream. So let's look at the first half together, uh, 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 the first 14 verses. And, um, and I want to make sure that I point out here before we start reading that is that this event, chapter half 7, happened before chapter 6. It's not in chronological order because it's still referring to Belshazzar. In chapter 6, Belshazzar was out of the picture and the Medes and Persians had already come in. So chapter 7 is reverting back to a time frame at some point when Belshazzar was still the king before the Medes and Persians came in. Just, just kind of a, a reference point for us. So let's pick it up in verse 1. It says, In the first year of King Belshazzar of Babylon, Daniel had a dream with visions in his mind as he was lying on his bed. He wrote down the dream, and here is the summary of his account. Daniel said, in my vision at night, I was watching, and suddenly the four winds of heaven stirred up the great sea. Four huge beasts came up out of the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion, but had eagle's wings. I continued watching until its wings were torn off. I, it was lifted up from the ground, set, its feet like a, set on its feet like a man, and given a human mind. Suddenly another beast appeared, a second one, that looked like a bear. It was raised up on one side with three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up, gorge yourself on flesh. After this, while I was watching, suddenly another beast appeared. It was like a leopard with four wings of a bird on its back. It had four heads and it was given dominion. After this, while I was watching in the night visions, suddenly a fourth beast appeared, frightening and dreadful and incredibly strong with large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and it trampled with its feet whatever was left. 
It was different from all the beasts before it, and it had ten horns. While I was considering the horns, suddenly another horn, a little one, came up from among them, and three of the first horns were uprooted before it. And suddenly in this horn there were eyes like the eyes of a human and a mouth that speak, uh, spoke arrogantly. As I kept watching, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat, and his clothing was white like snow." And the hair of his head was like the whitest wool. His throne was flaming fire. Its wheels were blazing fire. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from his presence. Thousands upon thousands served him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was convened and the books were opened. And I watched then because the sound of the arrogant words the horn was speaking. And as I continued watching, the beast was killed and its body destroyed and given over to the burning fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was removed, but an extension of life was granted to them for a certain period of time. I continued watching in the night visions and suddenly one like a son of man was coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was escorted before him. He was given dominion and glory and a kingdom so that those of every people, nation, and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Lord, we just pray in these next few minutes as we think through this chapter, as we Look for those things that you would be saying to us. Help us, Lord, to hear, see, understand the things that, that you desire for us to, to do today. Guide us in our thoughts, our actions, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I think what we need to notice here is that, that God does not give Daniel the names of any of these four beasts. Instead, he gives Daniel a description of each of the four beasts. Now, the question would be, some might say, well, did God not know the names of those four beasts? And I would smile and shake my head. <laughs> God is sovereign. He knows it all. He knows the names. But I'm guessing that probably the reason why God didn't name them was in order to test our trust and belief system. Is the Bible the inspired, infallible words of God of an all-knowing God, do we really trust that he's sovereign, that he's got a handle on this? And the answer, I hope, is yes. <laughs> that's, that's the thing. He wants us to trust him. We should, we should notice that God gives Daniel more information about the fourth beast than the other three combined. Far more is mentioned concerning this fourth beast simply because it, it is ruling just prior to the second coming of Jesus. This fourth beast will be far more destructive than any of the other three beasts that came before it. The fourth beast will be replaced by the kingdom of God. And this will take place at the fullness of the second coming of Christ. Now I'm going to say that the fullness of the second coming of Christ because the way I understand the second coming of Christ, it begins with the rapture. And the church is taken away, the people of God are taken away. And seven years later, Jesus fully returns to earth. Now, I, the rapture is part of the second coming, but it's not the fullness of the second coming. And when we think about this stuff in God's timing, when, it, when Jesus said, okay, and the Psalms tells us that a thousand years is like, so when we're thinking about seven years, it happens so fast on God's timeline that it's one big event. For us, we think seven years, that's like eternity, Right? <laughs> well, the rapture takes place, and seven years later, and eternity later, Jesus returns. But in God's mind, this, this is this one big event that takes place. The church is raptured up. Jesus comes to get those who are prepared. And then, and then the tribulation happens, and then his second coming. And so that's probably deeper than I wanted to go for this morning, but that just kind of, I think, helps us to understand. This is one big event that takes place here. So let's jump into the second half of, of Daniel's dream, and then we'll, we'll talk some about the interpretation. Starting in verse 15, As for me, Daniel, my spirit was deeply distressed within me, and the visions in my mind terrified me. I approached one of those who were standing by, and, and, and I asked him to clarify all of this, so he let me know the interpretation of these things. These huge beasts 
four in number, are four kings who will rise from the earth. But the holy ones of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever. Then I wanted to be clear about the fourth beast, the one different from all of the others, extremely terrifying with iron teeth and bronze claws, devouring, crushing, and trampling with its feet whatever was left. I also wanted to know about the ten horns on its head and about the other horn that came up before which three fell. The horn that had eyes and a mouth that, arrog that spoke arrogantly and looked bigger than all the others. As I was watching this horn wage war against the holy ones and was prevailing over them until the Ancient of Days arrived and a judgment was given in favor of the holy ones of the Most High. For the time had come and the holy ones took possession of the kingdom. This is what he said. The fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on the earth, different from all other kingdoms. It will devour the whole earth, trample it down, and crush it. The ten horns are ten kings who will rise from this kingdom. Another king, different from the previous ones, will rise after them and subdue three kings. Now he will speak words against the Most High and oppress the holy ones of the Most High. He will intend to change the religious festivals and laws and the holy ones will be handed over to him for a time, times, and a half time. The court will, be con will convene and his dominion will be taken away to, completely, to be completely destroyed forever. The kingdom, dominion, and greatness of the kingdoms under all of heaven will be given over to the people, the holy ones of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom and all rulers will worship and obey him. This is the end of the account. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts terrified me greatly, and my face turned pale, but I kept the matter to myself. I think it would terrify me to have that dream. <laughs> and then to begin to get some of those interpretations, I think that would terrify me as well. So as we think through this interpretation a little bit, these, these four beasts represent four different kingdoms, and, and as we've, we've studied this, looked at this, understand this uh, from a perspective that is a couple, several thousand years away from Daniel's dream, we understand that the fourth beast represents the fourth kingdom that will be ruling really at the point of the second coming of Jesus. The first question almost everyone who has done much study on this book of Daniel wants to ask and answer is, what is the identity of these four kingdoms? Well, beast number one represents the kingdom of Babylon. We see it in, in verse 4. It says, The first was like a lion, but had eagle's wings. Daniel says, I continued watching until the wings were torn off, and it was lifted up from the ground, set on its feet like a man, and given a human mind. And, and so we see this kind of played out in King Nebuchadnezzar and then Belshazzar and, and all of the things that the, the, Nebuchadnezzar being taken off and sent off for all those years of eating grass and being like a wild animal and all those things. We, we, we see that where it fits exactly there. The second beast represents the kingdom of the Medes and Persians. They're the ones that overthrew Belshazzar. We talked about that last Sunday. Verse 5 says, Suddenly another beast appeared, a second one that looked like a bear, was raising up on one side with three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, Get up and gorge yourself on flesh. And we saw as you study world history, you see how that played out in the Medes and Persians and all the things that they did and, and uh, the, the places that they conquered. The third beast represents the kingdom of Greece. Verse 6 says it this way, after this while I was watching, suddenly another beast appeared. It was like a leopard with four wings of a bird on its back. It had four heads and it was given dominion. And again, history, world history tells us that upon the death of Alexander the Great, who came out of Greece, his kingdom was divided up amongst his four generals, and it didn't take long and all that went sideways because none of them were quite the leaders that Alexander the Great was, and the whole thing went sideways and not very long after that. So the bigger issue then and question people work at answering is this identity of the fourth kingdom. Verse 7 says... After this, while I was still watching in the night visions, suddenly a fourth beast appeared, frightening and dreadful and incredibly strong with large iron teeth. 
it devoured and crushed and trampled with its feet whatever was left. So this fourth beast represents the, the Roman Empire being renewed. And we know that at the time that Jesus was on the earth, the Roman Empire kind of controlled the whole earth at that time, the, the then known world at that time. And, and when we get to the last days, when we get to the time that, uh, of the revelation and all of those pieces, this Roman Empire is going to be revived. And then we see a little bit more about that in, down in verses 23 to 25. Let me, let me just read those couple of verses there. This is what he said. The fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on the earth, different from all the other kingdoms. It will devour the whole earth, trample it down, and crush it. The ten horns are ten kings who will rise from this kingdom, and another king, different from the previous ones, will rise after them and subdue three kings. He will speak words against the Most High and oppress the holy ones of the Most High. He will intend to change the religious festivals and laws, and the holy ones will be handed over to him for a time, times, and a half time. So the Roman Empire is going to be revived by ten kings. That's the ten horns. It's the, the revision or the renewal of this old Roman Empire. And then, and then and then the 11th king is going to rise up and subdue or conquer three of those first ten kings that are a part of the revision of the old Roman Empire. This 11th king will speak, ultimately will speak against God and devour or control the entire earth. And he will make war against God's people. And finally, he's going to be destroyed at the second coming of Christ when the, the fullness of the second coming happens and Jesus returns physically, literally to the earth. This 11th, this Antichrist, will be destroyed. Now, I'm going to just take a second here and, and um, just give a point of clarification on the statement that it's, it says there that he will make war on God's people. Because some, peop some people will read that and they confuse and they think, well, the church must go through the tribulation because he's going to make war on God's people. But as we, as we know, Daniel was written hundreds of years before Jesus came to earth. And Daniel would understand God's people in his day. Uh, this is talking about Jewish people, not the modern church. And, and at this point, that's being referenced in Daniel's dream, the church, those who are walking in relationship with Christ. And it, it doesn't mean that if you go to church, you get to be raptured. It means you've got to have a relationship with Jesus. And, and so at this point, the church, those walking in relationship with Christ, they will have been raptured at the, that first moment, that first instance of the second coming, at the rapture of the church. The church will be raptured away. But many of the Jews now, there are certainly Jewish believers today who have received Christ as Messiah, and uh, we would call them we tend to call them Messianic Jews, but many of the Jewish people still reject that. And so as Daniel says that this beast will make war against God's people, the beast, the Antichrist, is going to make war against the Jewish people who are left during the tribulation. And that's the holy ones that are being referenced here as that takes place. And the Jewish people are still God's chosen people, and, and they just many of them have not accepted Christ as Messiah and Lord, and the Antichrist is going to make war against them. So, so that's kind of this, this chapter. It's, there, there's, you know, I mean, we could spend months and months and months looking at all of these details and, and trying to flesh out all of these, and people have done that. <laughs> but that's not the intent of me, my intent for this series of messages, and I don't think that's where God wants us to go. So as we kind of begin wrapping up this seventh chapter, what can we take home from Daniel chapter 7? The very first thing that I would say that we should take home from this is, is this statement. When things appear out of control, know that God is always in control. Whenever things seem to be out of control in your life, you can have confidence. You can trust that God always has it in control. We remember the, that in the, we sometimes refer to life as the game of life. There are always two halves. And verse 15 describes for us how Daniel really felt at halftime. He, he says, as for me, Daniel, my spirit was deeply distressed within me and the visions in my mind terrified me. 
And so at this halftime piece of his dream, Daniel found himself with a distressed spirit and a terrified mind. And who among us wouldn't have been? Daniel couldn't make any sense of what he just saw. And it may be that today, in your situation, in your life, you feel crushed by the circumstances of life. Maybe you feel a bit trampled upon. What should you do? When your mind is troubled and distressed in your spirit, what should you do when you're terrified and disturbed in your mind? We should look up. We should look up and see the greatness of God. In verses 9 and 10 of this chapter, Daniel says, I kept watching, and thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. Praise God. Praise God. His clothing was white like snow, and his hair of his head was like the whitest wool. His throne was flaming fire. Its wheels were blazing fire. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from his presence. And thousands upon thousands served him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him, and the court was convened, and the books were open. Truth is, I've been saying this for weeks now, and will continue, friends. God is sovereign. His throne is a permanent throne. There is nothing in this world, there is nothing in all creation that can unseat him from his throne. And the second piece is his timing is perfect. He's on his throne and his timing is perfect. We, when, when we are feeling crushed in spirit, when we're feeling terrified and perplexed and, and overwhelmed with the stuff of life, we look up and get a fresh vision of the greatness of God. That's what happened for Isaiah in Isaiah 6, when all of life was going sideways, and Isaiah is wondering this, and God gives him this incredible vision of, he didn't really even see God. He saw the train of his robe filled the temple. And and Isaiah said, oh, I'm undone. I'm ruined. (laughs) Life is over. And God said, it's okay. I'm going to take care of you. When we can get a fresh vision of his greatness, everything can change. We look up and we see the glory of Christ. Look at verses 13 and 14 one more time. He he says, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like the Son of Man, coming in the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. And he was given authority and glory and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and people of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. When we feel life is out of control, we need to look to the one that will always be in control. His kingdom and his dominion will never end. We look up to see him, not not as the first time that he came to earth, Sometimes we look up and we simply want to see the baby, right? We want to see the baby in the manger. But he's far from that baby in the manger today, friends. He's the lion of Judah. He is the king eternal. He is the one who will never relinquish his power and authority. He's the, when we look up and see him as he will be at the second coming, we will see the glory of his deity we will see the the glory of his authority, the glory of his power, the glory of his dominion, and the glory of his kingdom. And there are things that the Scripture, those are all things the Scripture gives us some, some pictures of, and we can begin to imagine the beauty of those things and the majestic looks and, and of all of that, but our eyes haven't begun to see anything that relates to the glory of his deity or authority or power or dominion or kingdom. And in that day, when we begin to see him as he truly is, everything will change for us because when we can get a glimpse of that, the truth is for most of us, for all of us, the first half is is nearly over. The second half is about to begin when all of these things begin to play out and And the great thing is, we know who wins. (laughs) We know who wins. Daniel tells us, even in his dream, he sees it. And and, and now, in this in-between time, the best players use the time to prepare themselves for the second half. 
Maybe, maybe they need to find a word of encouragement. Maybe they need a, a wound to be attended to. Maybe they just need someone to come along and strengthen them. That's this point that we're at in this, in this life that we live. We, we need to gather ourselves together. We need to be looking at God and, and at Christ for who they really are and gather our strength. And no, this isn't quite over yet. We still have some time here, and we still have an assignment. And the assignment is that none would perish but that all would come to repentance. That, that there are so many that still need to hear this message of Christ. And, and we have to remember that when things appear out of control, God is always in control. And I'm going to close it with something that's related and unrelated to this at the same time. So last Sunday night, I was out at the prison. And we have two services, uh, one at 6 o'clock, and one at 7 o'clock, and they're about 55 minutes, and I steal an extra six or seven minutes. <laughs> and, and as I was waiting for the first service to start, uh, the two ladies that were kind of there, the, the, they set up the chairs and make sure the sound's working and the, all the stuff, and I'm in there in this room with these two ladies, and they're telling me about some stuff that's going on in the prison, and and uh, so, something that's uh, stirred with a chaplain, and I don't know all those details. I didn't ask a lot of questions, but they said, ever since that happened about two weeks ago, there's been this, this battle going on, and people are hating on each other and saying, doing mean things and all of these things. And I, as I listened to that, I said, you know what? Let's pray before service, because I think this is a spiritual attack. Because I think that God wants to do something incredibly powerful in this facility, not just for you ladies, but for the staff here as well. And we took a minute and we prayed together. And, um, and I, they just, you could just see that they were really kind of unsettled. And, and as I was preaching the message on Sunday night, and, and God kind of took me on a side journey from one of the points, and we shared that. And then I gave an altar call at the end of that first service. And... And I said, you know, it's just, it's just time to repent. It's time to give. This, this. And, and they just, all over the room, were filling up time. I couldn't, I couldn't count fast enough because the bell was ringing for it was to move. And between those two services, more than 75 women stood to give their lives to, in repentance to Jesus. And, and in their hearts, it was like, things are out of control. This is what's going on. Pa Pastor Brad, this, this is just out of control. What do we do with this? But when it seems like it's out of control, God is still in control. God is still in control. And 75 women plus, I didn't get the whole number because it just happened so fast in both of those services, stood to pray a prayer of repentance. And they were, they're coming to me with tears streaming down. Their, they're leaving. They got to leave because the move, they got 10 minutes or seven minutes to move when the bell sounds. But several of them had come down, tears. Just, I can't thank you enough for, for this. We, I, this. I desperately, because they knew they needed Jesus. And, and when, when it's all out of control, Daniel learns this. It's, it's God still in control. And if we can, if we can look to him, and, and I'm not just talking about if I can make eye contact with God, it's going to be okay. If we look to him, if we trust in him, if we believe what he says, if we act on what he says, it's going to be in control again. It's when we think we can do it all on our own and we have our own abilities and our own strength and all of those stuff, we're not looking to him at those moments. We might acquiesce and say, yeah, yeah, I know Jesus, I blah, 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 blah. But unless we're doing what he asked us to do, we're not looking to him. If we're not responsive to his word, we're not looking to him. So when life gets out of control, we look to him. We trust him. Even when it doesn't make sense, we say yes and do it because he's trustworthy. And some of the messages that I preached last Sunday night, to be very honest with you, it didn't make any sense to me. But it made perfect sense to about 100 women. And they were ready to give their lives to Jesus. What an incredible moment. And we rejoice in God's goodness. And, and some of the things we see happening in Ukraine, and we hear testimonies and, and accounts of that, it's out of control. But as they look to God as they trust in him, as they act on things that he's asked them to do, they're seeing miraculous things happen because God is still in control. But the key is we have to choose to look to him. Not just read the Bible, but act on those things. 
Not just pray, but do those things. That's, that's looking to them. And so I'll quit with that message and we'll close in prayer. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your word and, and the gift of your word and the gift of your Holy Spirit. And God, I, I still rejoice over the women who surrendered their lives to you last Sunday night. What a glorious evening as, as lives began to be changed by the power of your word and forgiveness. And, and in our lives, when things seem out of control, when things seem overwhelming and we feel like we're being crushed by the weight of this world, we can look to you. We can trust in you in every situation, in every moment. We can, we can trust in you. Because you never lose control. Father, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your salvation and your encouragement in the word that that you know everything that's going to happen. You've shown us that you know everything that's going to happen and you have an answer prepared in every situation. Lord, we thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just stand with me. We'll sing this song together. Uh, Sue's playing and we'll close in prayer. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided. Praise the Lord. I'm, I don't want to embarrass Davis or anything, but I understand Davis got engaged this week. <laughs> and some of you are going to want to congratulate them on your way out. <laughs> I don't mean to embarrass you or anything, but, I, but that's kind of how it happens, right? <laughs> so you may want to congratulate them uh, on your way out this morning. Pastor Hank, would you close us in prayer?